If you've ever lived in Toronto, you probably have your own idea about what might be the oldest constructions by the European colonizers here. Of course, there are lots of cases of indigenous sites here in Toronto, including Tabor Hill, a funerary mound in Scarborough, and a number of palisaded villages. But there are also some buildings that date to the first decades of European colonization here. Some of you might think of Fort Rouillet, the French fort built in 1751 and burned down in 1759, whose meager ruins lie on the southern edge of what is now the Canadian National Exhibition Grounds. Or there are also similar French outposts that once stood in the Humber Valley. Or you might think of Scatting Cabin, originally built in the Don Valley in 1794, but dismantled and rebuilt on the exhibition grounds, quite close to the Fort Rouillet site, in 1879. Some of you might disqualify those because the first is no longer standing and the second has been moved from its original location. You might instead think of one of the buildings at Fort York. Two of the existing blockhouses there were built in 1813, after the original buildings of the fort were blown up in the retreat from the American attack and capture of the town of York. Better candidates might be John Cox's cottage on Broadview Avenue. It was built in 1807 and is still occupied today. And there's the Gibraltar Point Lighthouse, built in 1809 and still there, even though the lakefront has advanced far beyond it in the past two centuries. A bit farther afield, there's also the Osterhout Log Cabin in Scarborough. It could have been built as early as 1794 or as late as 1815. We can't be quite sure. But what if I told you that there's one European construction in Toronto that's far older than any of these? And what if I told you that it dates no later than 1714? You heard correctly, 1714. You could find this structure in the southern part of what is now High Park. Not only is this structure a lot older than Toronto itself, it may even have been designed by the renowned English architect Sir Christopher Wren, who is best known for his design for the St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Like Scatting Cabin, this structure is not in its original location. It's not even in its original country. You may have walked by it many times without realizing what it is or how old it is. What I'm talking about is this fence that stands in front of the grave monument of John and Jemima Howard. How it got here is a fascinating story. After the old St. Paul's Cathedral was gutted in London's Great Fire of 1666, Sir Christopher Wren was engaged to design and build its replacement. Construction continued until at least 1711, but it officially reopened to great fanfare in 1710. Wren reportedly opposed putting a fence around the new cathedral, but the rebuilding commission overruled him, and a foundry in Lamberthurst, Sussex, manufactured the cast iron fence elements that were installed from 1710 to 1714. This was one of the first cast iron fences in England and it surrounded St. Paul's Cathedral until 1873, when it was removed and sold to a scrap dealer. Way over in Canada, a retired architect named John G. Howard heard about the fence and contacted his London-based brother-in-law to ask him to buy it for him and ship it to Toronto. He did this, and in 1874 he shipped it aboard the steamer Delta. John George Howard, born in England in 1803, was Toronto's first surveyor and civil engineer. He was also the architect of many of Toronto's first public buildings, including the Home District Jail, St. John's Church at York Mills, and the Bank of British North America at the corner of Young and Wellington Streets. He also designed and built his own home, Colburn Lodge, in 1836. It still stands here in High Park, uh, which was originally Howard's 160-acre estate and sheep farm then to the west of the city. In 1873, Howard donated the estate to the city of Toronto on condition that he and his wife would remain living here until their deaths and that the city would maintain the, the property as a park in perpetuity. Originally, Howard's estate extended all the way from what is now Bloor Street down to Lake Ontario at the south end. Uh, but from 1854 onwards, uh, there was a strip of land along the south edge of the property that was ceded to the Hamilton and Toronto Railway uh, because Howard sold it to them for 300 pounds. It was about the same time as the donation agreement in 1873 
that Howard decided to arrange for the shipment of the fence to Toronto uh, so that it could be used in front of the grave monument here. He also designed the grave monument at that time for himself and his wife Jemima. Jemima died of cancer in 1877. But the fence's journey to Toronto was far from trouble-free. On November 7, 1874, the steamship Delta, while in heavy fog in the St. Lawrence estuary near Cap Chat, Gaspé, struck a sandbar. According to contemporary reports in Montreal's Morning Gazette, attempts to get the ship off the sandbar failed, and the ship and entire cargo were lost. However, this did not deter John Howard. We know what followed thanks to an article from the Brighton Herald that was later reprinted in the Canadian Antiquarian and Numismatic Journal in 1880. At great expense, Howard hired a crew to salvage the fence from the wreck. But the salvers found that most of the pieces they were able to retrieve from the wreck were badly damaged by seawater and wave action, and they were only able to salvage a small portion. They shipped the most serviceable pieces first to Montreal and then by train to Toronto. There was only enough to extend across the front of the grave area as you see here today. John G. Howard died in February of 1890 and was buried alongside Jemima near this grave monument that you see today. High Park has continued to be a place of recreation and a small zoo ever since. However, the age and significance of the fence you see here has almost been completely forgotten.